as we study together this morning. As if you will, to uh, start off, if you will, open your Bibles to Luke, the 18th chapter. Luke 18 and beginning in verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. I fast twice a week, give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went, just, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Green light was on earlier. Thank you. My apologies. Let me make sure this is turned on. I think that's on. All right. Can everybody hear me now? All right. Let me, uh, let me read verses 9 through 14 again, since there may be some in the auditorium, not in the foyer who didn't hear. We're reading from Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning in verse 9. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. One of the things that's interesting to me as we study the New Testament is just how often you find one of two things. You either find examples of Jesus praying, and that in and of itself is a, a good study. Go and look at the times when Jesus prayed. We have many examples of Jesus going to God in prayer, and we can learn a lot from that. And the other thing that we have is we have a number of examples of Jesus teaching about prayer, and this is one of those situations. In fact, the context here is in a context of teaching about prayer. He began by saying that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, and he told another parable. But as he tells this parable, there's something that he wants us to understand about when we pray and how we pray. And what I want us to do is look at these two men and look at the example. Particularly, we want to look at the prayer of the tax collector here. And as we go into this, it's important to Keep in mind the attitude that they had toward tax collectors. Tax collectors were considered about the lowest people in Jewish society as you could get. They were right there with Gentiles. On the other hand, in their society, the Pharisees were the religious elite. They were the ones that everybody looked up to. They were the ones that everybody thought, well, you know, if there's anybody that knows how to serve God... It's the Pharisees. And yet, it's interesting that in verse 14, Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. That alone would come as a huge shock to the Jews. That there is any way possible that a tax collector could stand at any time or any way more justified before God than a Pharisee. So let's take a look at this prayer that the tax collector offers and see what lessons we can learn from this. 
Let's first of all look at the target of his prayer. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want us to stop and think for a moment about the significance of who he was praying to. And think about the significance of who we pray to. When we offer our prayers, is our intent to communicate with God? You know, the prayer of the Pharisee is a real contrast, isn't it? You think back to Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 6 about the Pharisee standing on the corner and praying aloud and offering long prayers. What was the purpose of that? For the praise of men. They want people to pat him on the back and say, man, there is a guy, he is really righteous. That guy really knows what he's talking about when he offers his prayers. But men should not be the target of our prayers. Our prayers should not be so that we can impress the person sitting in the pew, or even worse, ourselves. What did the Pharisee do throughout his prayer? Lord, look at how good I am. It's almost as if to say, Lord, aren't you really glad that you've got me? But that was not the way that the sinner, that the tax collector addressed his prayer. When we go to God in prayer, do we understand that we're not able to fool God about who we are? You know, one of the challenges that the Pharisees had was they couldn't see themselves. And furthermore, they didn't understand that God could see who they were. You know, Psalm 139 can either be a great comfort or it can be a real wake-up call. When you turn to Psalm 139, begin in verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Even the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. When we go and we kneel down before God in prayer, we stand in prayer, and we offer these things, and this Pharisee stands there and says, boy, God, I'm just so good. He's not fooling God. We might be fooling those who, we're listening to, who are listening to us, we might convince them of how eloquent we are and how close a connection we have with God. But God knows what we really are when nobody else is looking. Do we understand that when we go to God in prayer? When we offer our thoughts to Him, do we recognize who He is? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, Jesus said this, Therefore do not be like them, for the heaven, their Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Which brings us to the next point in understanding the God that we're praying to. When we go to God in prayer, on one hand we don't want to try to conf think that we can confuse God with who we really are, but on the other hand, do we go to God and understand the power and the wisdom that He has? Do we really trust in God in our prayers? Do our prayers reflect that we trust God's power and God's wisdom? Do we bring to God our deepest needs and concerns? 
Do we lay our burdens at his feet with the belief that he can indeed help us? I was fortunate enough uh, just a little over a week ago to be able to to teach on Daniel chapter 4. And it was one of those very interesting passages because it reminds us of how God is involved in the lives of men. Do we believe that? Do we believe that he has the power that we read about in Genesis chapter 1 of being able to create the world, that we read about in Genesis chapters 6 through 9 to destroy the world by flood, that he had the, has the power that he did when he delivered the Israelites out of Egypt, that he had the power and the wisdom to plan out man's salvation from before time began and have the power to raise Jesus from the dead to fulfill that plan. Do we really believe that that's the being that we are praying to when we go to God in prayer. Let us think about the God that we pray to. But let's look at something else in this man's prayer. And that is, let's look at his self-acknowledgement. You know, he says here, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, when we use the term sinner, we generally have in mind somebody else. So tell me, who, who do you know that's a sinner? Well, you know, there's this guy at work, he does this. You know, there's this woman that I grew up with, and, you know, her life is just a mess. And, you know, my, my, my brother, I, you know, I know, and, and my sister, you know, she did this and that and the other. I use my sister because she happens to be sitting in the audience this morning, so I had to throw that reference in for her benefit. We can think of what everybody else, you know, I know those people at the church, I, I, this, there's this guy, you know, I know he's doing some things he really ought not be doing. Well, what about you? Well, you know, I, there are some things that are right, but I, I've got a reason for that. I've got excuses for the things that I'm doing in my life that justify what I'm, I'm not really a sinner. Does that sound at all like the Pharisee? Does it sound like the Pharisee who says, Lord, I'm not like other men. Not me. Extortioners and unjust and adulterers. And maybe that's how we justify ourselves as not being sinners. I don't commit the big sins. I don't commit the bad sins. But you know, Kevin very appropriately read Romans 3, verse 23, didn't he? What did Romans 3, 23 say all men are sinners who have done really bad things all men are sinners who have violated the really big rules of god no that's not what romans 3:23 says romans 3:23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god you know one of the things that always stood out to me about Nehemiah's prayer, when you turn back to the book of Nehemiah, and, you know, I know we really aren't supposed to have favorite books of the Bible. We're supposed to respect them all. But Nehemiah is, I have to admit, one of my favorites because I think that Nehemiah pre presents such a great example of leadership. Nehemiah is one of the greatest examples of leadership that we have because of some of the things that we see in the way that he addressed the situation that existed in Jerusalem. And here's one of the first things that we see. Nehemiah heard word of what was going on in Jerusalem, the fact that the walls had still not been rebuilt. And so in verse 5, it's, he says he's going to, we read about his prayer to God, beginning in verse 5, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. Look, there's, there's our first point, wasn't it? He understands the being to whom he's praying. My, my Lord, my awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you. Now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and tell you just how bad everybody else has been there. And can you please help those people do something right? That isn't what Nehemiah said, was it? 
Nehemiah says this, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the, chin of the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. Now, he acknowledges the sins of the house of Israel. And Israel was where they were because of their sin, because of their failure to put God first, to make him their one and only God, and to serve him faithfully. But Nehemiah also acknowledges his own sin that he has failed. You know, Matthew chapter 7 has been so badly misused to teach people not to judge. But what is Jesus teaching in Matthew chapter 7? He's saying, you can help others, but do what first? <laughs> what do you need to do before you can help others with the sin that's in their life? You need to acknowledge the sin that's in your life. You need to recognize that you are a sinner. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance when speaking to the Pharisees. He wasn't telling the Pharisees that they were righteous and that he, they didn't need him. What he's saying is you don't recognize that you are a sinner. You don't recognize that you need what I have to offer. Guess what? I do not have an appointment with a cancer doctor on my calendar. Do you know why? Because as far as I know, I don't have cancer. So I have no need to schedule an appointment with a cancer doctor. And as long as I don't recognize that I am a sinner, I'm not going to do anything about that. I'm not going to ask God for help with that. I'm not going to depend on God to overcome that sin. There are a lot of good programs that help people overcome things in their lives. And I am not saying there's anything wrong with seeking secular help to overcome challenges of alcoholism or drug abuse or other things that we may face. But we are not truly going to become who we need to be until we recognize that at the root of all of those things is that we are sinners. We're not going to become who God wants us to be. Even if we don't have the big problems, we're not going to be who we need to be until we acknowledge that we are sinners and we need God's help. It's interesting to look at Psalm 32. It's an interesting study in the life of a man who generally speaking, was held in high esteem for his faith. In fact, every king after him was compared in faith. Every other king in Judah was compared in faith to the faith of David. And yet there was a time when even David failed to acknowledge his sin. In Psalm 32, and beginning in verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now here's where it gets interesting. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with song. Of deliverance you know if we understand that we are sinners we will have a similar attitude that David did 
And that is, it will be a burden on our heart. David, we, we go and we read the story. We're going to take time this morning to read the story in 2 Samuel where Nathan comes to David and utters a very powerful accusation. And he tells David, David, you are the man. But he wasn't telling him he was a good man. He was telling him, David, you are a sinner. You are a murderer. You are an adulterer. You are a liar. And whether Psalm 32 is about that specific incident or something else in David's life, it's interesting that David says, I did not feel relief from that burden until I acknowledged to God what I had done. And he forgave me. David is an interesting example in this case because as far as I know, there were very few people who knew what David had done. Clearly there were some. But I presume that for most of the nation and for most people, they never knew what David had engaged in. And as I said, David was still held up as a man of faith whose heart was one after the Lord's own heart. But David was a sinner. And when we kneel down before God in prayer, do we kneel down before God as somebody with a bucket list of things that we need? Lord, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this. Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? Lord, I, I, you know, another thing I got that I need is this. I think sometimes we view God more as a gift giver from the standpoint of fulfilling our, for physical, our physical needs than we do as one who is our Lord and our God to whom we answer accountable as sinners. Does it mean it's wrong to go to God and ask for certain things? Certainly not. James, of course, teaches that we have to have the right heart when we ask. But when we kneel before God, do we kneel before Him recognizing that we kneel before Him as one who has violated His will, His law, we are sinners. It's interesting that in our story back in Luke chapter 19, that the Pharisee, one of the very people to whom he compared himself was who? I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector. I'm glad I'm not like him. You know what that says? He didn't realize that he was exactly like that tax collector. He, too, was a sinner. And until he acknowledged his sin, he was not going to seek help. If tomorrow I find out I have cancer, I will make an appointment with the cancer doctor because now I need it. Guess what? We all need to talk to God because we are all sinners. And then he says something else. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do we understand that our only hope of salvation is God's mercy and grace. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9 is a passage that we work so hard to counter the false doctrine that is used in this passage that sometimes I'm afraid we miss the truth of this passage. He says, beginning in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now before I go any further, let me say, 
I believe we have a responsibility to change our works as we change our character. You read the rest of the book of Ephesians, and starting in chapter 4, he talks about that very thing. Even here, he says, we're a workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. There is an expectation of how we will conduct ourselves as Christians. And failure to do that is a reflection of a failure of a change of character. But let's be absolutely clear about what Paul is saying here. He's saying there is absolutely nothing, nothing that anybody can do to walk up to the gates of heaven and say, God, you got to let me in. I don't care what the ledger sheet says about how many dollars you gave to the church or to assist brethren in need. Say, Lord, look at all the money I gave. doesn't matter. It doesn't get you into heaven. Say, Lord, I never missed an assembly. You know, I was there when I was sick. I was there when I was hurt. I was there when I was sad. I was, you know what? I never missed an assembly of the saints, ever. Doesn't get you into heaven. Lord, I read my Bible every day. I studied diligently every day. Doesn't get you into heaven. only thing that gets us into heaven is the grace and the mercy of God who says I will forgive you through the blood of Jesus Christ when you acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you're dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ for your salvation that doesn't mean I can get to the gates of heaven as some people have said and said well Lord I lived everything contrary to your will, but I believe you gave me heaven. No, it doesn't work that way either. But I'm afraid sometimes we live and act as though we are somehow earning our way to heaven. And that just simply isn't going to happen. We're familiar with the parable that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus was trying to teach about forgiveness. And they said, well, how often should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Up to seven times? We're all familiar that seven was a number of perfection, a number of completion. And so to say that I'm willing to forgive somebody seven times was phenomenal. But you remember what Jesus said, don't you? Jesus said, I do not say up to you seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now, Jesus is not saying when you get to 491, you can quit forgiving. In fact, he goes on to tell a parable that explains exactly what he's talking about. There was a man who owed a debt he would never in his lifetime repay. I want you to think about the worst debt you've ever been in in your life. For some people, that's not much. For some people, that's a lot. I want you to think about the worst debt you can think of. Is it the debt that the United States of America owes and our trillion-dollar debt? You think, you think that's a pretty significant debt? Guess what? That pales in comparison to the debt that we owe to God for being sinners. And that's the picture that he paints in this parable. There was a man who owed a debt. There was absolutely no way whatsoever, no matter what he did, that in his entire lifetime he would ever repay that debt. And he went to the king and said, let me just get the, 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 the master. And he said, give me time. I'll pay it. And the master said, I forgive you. I forgive you. Now, unfortunately, that man didn't... <laughs> He didn't understand that concept, and he went to his own, somebody who owed him, and he didn't show the same compassion and forgiveness for a much smaller debt. One of the things that Jesus is trying to get us to understand is is that we owe a debt of sin that we can't do enough good. We can't work hard enough 
to ever pay off that debt of sin. Now, what we ought to do is out of gratitude for what God has done for us, we ought to do everything we can in the service of the Lord. But we can never pay off our debt. And we have to have the same mentality that this man had and say, Lord, be merciful to me. Please, Lord, show me mercy. I know I can't pay the debt I owe. Contrast, the Pharisee. Lord, I, I thank you. I'm such a good guy. He had no concept of what God was willing to offer him or the debt that he owed. He was arrogant. He was boastful. And he did not understand the God to whom he prayed or the fact that he was a sinner or the mercy that he needed from God. So as we say, so what? What does all that mean? Which one best describes us? Are we the Pharisee? Going about our lives thinking just how good we are and how righteous we are and how upstanding we are and how glad God must be to have us in the service of His kingdom. Boy, if God just had more people like me, the world would be a great place. Or are we like the tax collector who understands that we are but humble sinners only granted salvation by the grace and the mercy of God and throwing ourselves upon Him. I didn't think to find out who was leading singing this morning and find out what they were leading, but the song that has been selected could not be a better selection song that we're about to sing is Come Unto Me. It's a call to the Lord for people to come to Him. But in order to come to the Lord, you have to recognize your need to come to the Lord. You have to recognize that He's able to save you. You have to recognize who He is that you're coming to. You have to acknowledge that you are, in fact, a sinner in need of His assistance. And you have to throw yourself at His mercy, being willing to believe in Him, trust in Him, change your heart to follow Him, be willing to confess Him in your words and in your life that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to be willing to wash away your sins in the waters of baptism that you might be able to be justified and stand right before God. If you have a need this morning, will you not come as we stand and as we sing?